to reproduce New Testament Christianity in his day. And I'm going to read one of, prayer, one of the prayers of the Apostle Paul for an early church at Ephesus. And really, I think it encapsulates, it embraces what William Williams would have desired and what I know in your heart of hearts and in my little heart we too long for. Here's the prayer. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, 
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Let's pray. With those words ringing in our ears and resounding, having an echo in our hearts, however weak that may be, and yet it's true, Lord, that we long to grow into a deeper knowledge of yourself. We realize we're not the first Christians and that other Christians have gone before us who have relied on the same promise, prayed the same prayer, and had the same experience of the love of Christ flooding into their souls. Do this for us this evening as we look back in history at a time when you visited this land in great power and raised up men like William Williams with gifts to bestow upon the church a great legacy, a great heritage, and we draw upon that legacy today and grant us the same strength to be faithful, to glorify the Lord Jesus. Accept our prayers, hear our prayers, pardon our sins, and be with us now, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, it's a great privilege this evening to uh, be speaking about the legacy of William Williams. And you will see on the screen that the title there is The Legacy of William Williams Pantakelin. We know him mainly as a hymn writer. And if you go to your hymn books, well, particularly the Welsh one, uh, you will find that sometimes in a hymn book, after his hymn, there's the letter W, and then maybe there's a letter WW, or there's WWP. P, what does that mean? Well, it's for Pantakelin. There is William Williams behind me, and there's the farm Pantakelin, which, by the way, you can visit at any time. They're very, very kind. One of his descendants, Cecil Williams, is the farmer who runs the sheep, mainly a sheep farm. Very busy on the farm, but they're very welcoming and very gracious. And um, that's why he's called sometimes plainly just simply Williams Pantakelin, or even Pantakelin. Imagine a farm gaining notoriety to that extent that even that is sufficient to identify a hymn writer from Wales of all places. And uh, it's wonderful to think that. Now, he was uh, born in 1717 and died in 1791. So what does that say as a reason for us being here today? A tercentenary, a 300th anniversary of his birth. Very well. So he was born not at Pantakelin, but at a farm not all that far away from Pantakelin called Kevin Coyd. And uh, uh, that again is uh, nearby so that you can visit it. Um, what I'm going to do, just to have a, a little uh, mark for you to know what progress we're making, is first of all to give an outline of his life. And I'm going to brush through that fairly quickly. So the uh, slides and the photos that you'll see on the screen will, will go fairly quickly. In order to get to his contribution and its relevance for us today. So we remind ourselves, what was Williams Pantakelin? Preacher, hymn writer, theologian, communicator, pastor, revivalist. He could go on, but I'm not going to. And it's true to say that here was a man whose 
whose importance has been recognized. And, uh, well, the one thing that's there, which is the sign at Pantikelin Farm. You won't be able to read it from there, but it's the farm at Pantikelin, and the sign you'll find at the entrance to the farm today. If you go to Llandavri, you go on the, on the road to Brecon for about a mile or so, and there's a zigzag in the road, and there's a sign to the left saying Pantre Tigwin, and you need to go down there, and you go up, and you turn left at the bottom, go up left, and then carry on to Pantre Tigwin, and that's the entrance to the farm, and there it, it, you'll see it there. And uh, it, as I say, it's still in the family. Uh, those two stained glass windows are at the farm's door, its front door. On the right uh, is uh, William's Pantakelin with a quill in his hand, and you won't be able to make the words that he has written. But the words are, guide me, O thou great Jehovah, his most famous hymn, perhaps. On the left, then, uh, uh, he, there is just a photo, uh, just a, a, an imaginary um, portrait of William Williams and the flowers because one of his other hymns, uh, which we shall sing at the end, says, Rose of Sharon, thou art heaven's delight. Rose of Sharon. And that's all about Jesus Christ. And really his, his life stood out because he wanted to commend the Lord Jesus Christ as saviour, friend, Lord, King, as God, and really as our all in all. And there's something wonderful about one person being able to convey something of that through all that he was and all that he did. Right, well, to Pentriti Gwyn Chapel. There's a chapel in that little village. You pass it on the way to Pantakelin, and it has two stained glass windows. Uh, the uh, one has Wales as a background, uh, the one on the left, and then it shows uh, uh, above it the, in the form of a cross, of course, uh, that Wales was the background. Wales was the, was the parish for William Williams. He wasn't ultimately constrained to any one place. Such was the passion of his soul to make Jesus Christ known, that he insisted on going abroad, moving around from village to village, preaching in the open air, going on horseback, and uh, for all that, carrying on to preach the gospel. And then on the right-hand side, uh, you have a Bible in his hand to signify that his hymns were all based on Bible truth but it was truth that had been channeled through his experience. What does that tell us? It tells us a lot about hymns. And any hymn worth its salt or whatever will do the same for you and me. It'll stir something within us and we'll say, ah, oh, have I experienced Christ in that way? Am I rejoicing in the Lord? Do I sense that my sin is an offense to God, but there is forgiveness with him? And here's a hymn writer who is telling me these things in a wonderful way, and it warms my heart, and I go on my way rejoicing. Well, that's what a hymn should do. Now then, some numbers, just to impress you. And uh, at least two in the congregation were aware of these astronomic numbers, I think, because one of them said this, oh, on Thursday night, I'm going to bring supper with me. And another one said, I'm going to bring my morning cereal with me. They knew what I was like, I'm afraid. <laughs> but bear with me. Here are the numbers. How many hymns do you think he wrote? Over 750 Welsh ones. 123 English ones, and in um, Christian hymns, 
there are just 12 of the English hymns. Very well. What about some more numbers? Well, he wrote two long poems. And the poems were of a verse which was quite long. And there were four lines to it. But in each of those poems, listen how many were, there were, how many verses. In one, there was 1,366 verses. Oh yes, you should be impressed. And in the other, there was 1,451 verses. What does that say about the people of the day? They were a reading people. That is Christians. And uh, we shall come to those two books in a moment, but I shan't hold you for that long by going through them all. But I want you to realize how vast was the effort that went in to what Williams was doing for his countrymen. And I want you also to realize the value of reading good Christian literature and not least among the books of having a Bible as well as your hymn book in your time of devotion. It is absolutely helpful and fundamental, right? Well, now then, there were seven books that he translated from English. There were seven prose works that he wrote. And here's a title just to whet your appetite and make your little gray cells go dancing somewhere. Listen to the title of this, and I'm going to ask you a question. The Crocodile of Egypt's River. What on earth is the Crocodile of Egypt's River? Jealousy. You'd never have thought it, would you? I didn't until I started reading it. Jealousy. And that's what he does. He wants to remind God's people of the dangers of jealousy. So what does he do? Well, he sets it out as a crocodile. A crocodile is subtle. A crocodile is dangerous and deadly. And so he starts with Abel and Cain. And that Cain was jealous of Abel. So what did he do? Well, because he was jealous, he killed his brother. And God says to him, where is your brother? Oh, I, he says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Saying lies as well as murder. Jealousy is dangerous. And then you come later on in the Old Testament to a king called Ahab. And his neighbor was a man called Naboth. And he had a lovely vineyard and a very fruitful one. Oh, but Ahab was jealous. He couldn't sleep. And his wife was Jezebel. And Jezebel said to him, are you a king? Come on, grow up and use your authority. Get somebody to charge Naboth with blasphemy. And so it happened. Naboth was put to death. And Ahab took over the vineyard. Jealousy. And in the New Testament, do you remember the verse which says, that the Pharisees and the Jews were jealous of Christ, and so they put him to death. What does that tell us? Beware of jealousy. It's subtle, it's dangerous, it's deadly. And you see, Williams was concerned for Christian people that they should be aware of what the Bible was really saying and pressing home. And that it wasn't just enough to say, our oh, jealousy is a bad thing. Press it home and use biblical examples so that you and I are almost frightened out of our wits because of jealousy and its dangers. Well, there we are. Jealousy. Now then, there were 31 elegies, uh, that tributes that he wrote by way of poems again to uh, some of the members of uh, the societies, we'll come to those in a moment. But you see the effort that he was going to. Well, no. And, oh, two more things about his travels. And he traveled, he, uh, he claimed, a total of 111,000 
800 miles during his ministry throughout Wales on horseback. Uh, oddly enough, he sold tea on his travels. And the reason was this, there was such a tax on tea. And I don't know, he must have had access to cheap supplies of tea and thought that he would do uh, a good deed to people by taking the tea with him. But on one occasion, his servant had a problem. His horse had died. The problem was how to tell poor Williams that his horse had died. And so he thought he'd get round it in this way. Oh, Mr. Williams, your horse has gone to eternity. And Williams replied, I hope he's left a saddle behind. <laughs> that was Williams, the sense of humor, as well as the passion to take the gospel. Well, they do go together, you know. Well, now then, where are we? Um, the next one uh, is uh, just to show the importance of William Williams. At, at, at Llandevery in the tourist office, there's an exhibition upstairs, and uh, you can see Williams. He's on the left there. And the right, on the right, there's a statue of William Williams in Cardiff City Hall on the staircase, just to show something about his importance. So, um, oh, I think I've missed out one there. Yes, on the left, you'll see uh, another um, uh, glass, stained glass window, which is at Croice Chapel in Richmond Road, Cardiff. And then on the right uh, is a stained glass window of William Williams, and strangely enough, at Mount Turog in North Wales. And that was showing to show that in, uh, he was one who brought uh, fervency into the praise in worship, in the worship of God by his hymns at Mount Turog. All right. Now we're moving on because uh, we're running out of time. Places. Well, this map, I don't know if you can see it, but in the centre is Llandavery. Other places were connected with uh, William Williams are shown on it. Uh, to the right is Trevecca, not far from Brecon and Talgath. To the left uh, is Llandoror, and then Llangaitho is up on the left as well. And we'll come to those in a moment. But that's just to show that uh, it took in quite an area uh, as far as uh, his travels were concerned. Now this, uh, these stained glass win this stained glass window is at Llanvair ar Bryn Church. Llanvair ar Bryn is actually the parish where Ken Kevin Coyd and Pantacelin are situated. But it's on the fringe of Llandevery itself on the way out to uh, Llanwrtid and there's a very sharp end just after you leave the hospital on your left, and uh, Llanvair ar Bryn Church is there. There's a stained glass window in the church. There is also a memorial in the churchyard where he was buried. The stained glass window shows Rhys Pritchard on the left. I'm going to say a little word about him with a lantern, and on the right, William Williams with a harp. He is known as the sweet singer of Wales, Pier Ganyedir Camre, the sweet singer of Wales. Well, I'm saying a little word about Griffith Jones and um, Richard, Rhys Pritchard. Rhys Pritchard on the left, the plaque to him is in Llandingad Church, which is in Llandavri itself. That is the parish church of Llandavri. And there's a plaque to remember uh, Rhys Pritchard, who was born in the previous century. But listen to some of the wonderful verses that Rhys Pritchard wrote in Welsh for the common people. He wanted them, they had no uh, means really of remembering gospel truth other than to memorize scripture, but scripture was scarce. So he'd write these poems, publish them very cheaply, 
They were in Welsh, so they could be understood. Here are translations into English. This is about salvation. Twas Christ our peace with the Almighty wrought. Twas Christ our bliss and our salvation bought. Twas Christ that as God's, chil God's children made, that us God's children made. Twas Christ that saved us by his potent aid. And then some striking uh, verses on the Bible. Sell your shirt and sell your cattle. Sell your lands and sell your chattel. Sell, if needs be, all your treasure to possess the whole of Scripture. Better have no drink, no eating, house nor fire, bed nor clothing, light of day nor sun's warm shining than to have no gospel teaching. Wonderful stuff. Wonderful because it tells us what should be our priorities in life. Have we got the right priorities? We're living in a dangerous world, aren't we? The materialistic outlook and the, the feeling that you, you have to keep up with the Joneses and that you have to have possessions and so on. Ah, oh, no, get your priorities right, said Rhys Pritchard. And I think that the way of communicating the gospel in Rhys Pritchard that William Williams learnt a lot from Rhys Pritchard. The other one there is Griffith Jones. And uh, Griffith Jones was of Llandauror, and uh, he was an evangelical clergyman used in the conversion of Daniel Rowland. We'll come to him shortly. He was in trouble with the bishop because he used to go and preach in the open air on weekdays. But he supported the publication of Welsh Bibles and one of his great contributions was what was called the Welsh S Circulating Charity Schools. They were not just schools for children, they were for adults. And in those schools held for three months in the community, adults would be welcome to come and learn to read, to learn to read from the Bible and from the Catechism. That was Griffith Jones. Well, another wonderful man. Right, we're coming on now to the next one, which is um, Daniel Rowland and Howell Harris. It was Howell Harris who was used in the conversion of William Williams. William Williams wanted to, go, uh, to become a doctor, and he had gone to uh, an academy called Llwyn Llwyd, which was not far from where uh, Howell Harris lived, Trevecca and Talgarth. And one day, Williams was returning home, past the church at Talgarth, and what was going on? There was a crowd. They were listening to Harris preaching, preaching, it is said, on the stone of his father's grave. But this is what happened uh, to, uh, to William Williams, we are told. That's the spot forever treasured where I first his visage spied, that is William uh, Howell Harris, at the church's portly entrance with no path on any side. Listen, in a solemn, serious spirit, with eternity in sight, urging, pleading with the people from God's wrath to take their flight. Urgency, fervency. That's Howell Harris for you. Well, Howell Harris was used greatly uh, in Wales at that time. He'd go around preaching as a layman, was refused ordination, but nothing would hold him back. And his preaching, we are told, always came with power and often with large crowds in the open air. Listen to one of his uh, entries in a diary. I discoursed to 10,000 people. Shortly, the power came, which continued, hold your breath, which continued nearly four hours. What's wrong with a man? He's possessed with something, obviously. Possessed with what? With the love of Christ constraining him. And how was it that the people were listening? 
because God the Holy Spirit was at work and it was really in a time of revival and the presence of God was real in the entire community. So going to market didn't matter. People wanted more sermons. They would like sermons every day of the week if they could get them. But that was the time. And that was the instrument that God used. Somebody insignificant, nobody had ever heard of Howell Harris, Rebecca. But there he is in the hand of God becoming a great instrument of blessing. Well, the next one is Daniel Rowland. Daniel Rowland was a curate at Llangaitho in Cardiganshire. He was converted under Griffith Jones and uh, about 1735. And people were being converted under his ministry. The strange thing was that he started preaching the law and applied the Ten Commandments and texts like flee from the wrath to come. And people were under such conviction. And he really didn't know how to handle the situation. But a local minister called Philip Pugh said to him, preach Christ and tell them what Christ is like and they'll come to faith in Christ and be changed. And so it was. And his ministry was blessed, people were converted. And he started to gather them in uh, together as a little fellowship, which soon became a little society meeting. And that we'll listen, hear more about later on. Well, one Sunday, he was reading from the prayer book, what is known as the litany. Listen to this. While he was engaged one Sunday morning in reading the church service, his mind was more than usually occupied with the prayers. An overwhelming force came upon him as he was praying these words from the litany. By thine extreme agony and bloody sweat, by thy cross and passion, by thy precious death and burial, by thy glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Ghost. And as he uttered those words, a sudden amazing power seized his whole frame, and no sooner did it seize him, but it ran instantly like an electrifying shock through all the people in the church, so that many of them fell down to the ground. That's revival. And the amazing thing is this, it was at Langaithor, and there was Howell Harris in Breckenshire, near Brecon, Talga, Trevecca, and he was finding the same Holy Spirit doing such wonderful things. And their hearts were being warmed, and there was a sense of urgency in their preaching and in their praying. Well, now, I s said earlier that uh, Williams was. Uh, intent on becoming um, a doctor. He worshipped at uh, Kevnarthen Chapel, which is up on the right, uh, and that chapel, uh, there was a bit of a controversy going on there. There were two ministers, one was Arminian and one was Calvinist, so they were in deep water. However, that was ultimately resolved by Pantakelin giving a piece of land for Pentretty Gwyn Chapel, which was Calvinist, from their land. And we've seen a little about that already. And uh, then uh, Williams, studying uh, uh, to be med med studying medicine, and on the way home, hearing uh, how Howell Harris preach. And shortly after, he was constrained with a deep conviction that it wasn't medicine, the healing of men's bodies, but with the healing of men's souls that he should be concerned. So he was ordained in 1740 and served as a curate. And uh, bottom on the right there is the old Llanurte church. You can see it today on the way to Aberglas, Aber, uh, not Aberglas, no, to what is it? Um, well, it's outside Llanurte now. Anyway, from that time on, he was intent on preaching the Gospels. 
And through them, the two of them, the Methodism emerged. Now, Methodism, there you will see on the right uh, photograph of what was called the First Association. It's imaginary. And uh, from the right, uh, if I remember rightly now, uh, you've got, um, uh, I think on the right is Williams Pantakalin, Howell Harris, then in the centre, George Whitfield, and then on the left is, is Daniel Rowland. That, no, I, Daniel Rowland is on Whitfield's left, and William Williams on the right, and the others are not quite as important. But uh, Welsh Methodism. Methodism meant two things. One thing was order, that you should have method or discipline in your Christian life. It should be a disciplined life. And the other thing was that it should be a devotional life, which you shared with other people. So the Methodists had their society, and they insisted on that. And uh, we shall see why very shortly when we come to consider how uh, consider the contribution of William Williams to the whole idea of a society meeting, Christians coming together for fellowship. But enough for now to realize that here was an emerging Methodism. Uh, the church at large, religion, religion was seemingly dead, churches were empty, some of them were in ruins. The uh, preaching, if there was any at all, was all morality. Uh, live a good life and you'll be all right. Do your best, be kind, and uh, so on. Uh, and then there was a lot of what was called deism. God is, yes, he created the world, but he's abandoned it. So it's up to us now to keep things going and up to each one of, them, of, our, of us ourselves to work out our own destiny. And it was against that background that these men were beginning to preach the gospel of the grace of God. Dissent, independent churches, Baptist churches, they tended to be dry uh, with orthodoxy, but no life in them, no application of the gospel. Some of them certainly were faithful. We heard about Philip Pew a minute ago. So, so it was. But uh, sadly, most of them were not like that. Um, and uh, then the other thing was Howell Harris started preaching as a layman. And he would call it exhorting. So from these societies, you'd get young men coming up to be exhorters lay preachers and would start going about preaching the gospel. And then there was uh, the matter of uh, fervency and urgency, but the theme of the Methodists was this, the necessity for a new birth in every one of us. You must be born again. God must not just uh, change our attitude, he must change our hearts. He must plant a new instinct into our souls. Instead of the old instinct of selfishness and pride and worldliness, a new instinct which drew us like a magnet to God himself and which opened a new vista of living, living for eternity and the realities of spiritual issues. That's the new birth. And they were preaching things like that. People had never heard them before, so it seemed to them. And now it was a time of gospel harvest, reaping a word, a work that was a word and a, a seed that was sown. Now, the Methodists didn't, in Wales didn't become a denomination for a whole century. They stayed within Anglicanism. So Daniel Rowland stayed as, far, as, as long as he could as a, a curate in Llangaethol. William Williams had to leave his curacy at Llanurtid Church, and he went to help Daniel Rowland. Such was the blessing upon them. And uh, really, w w uh, that was also the providence of God. Joys, sorrows, 
and later life. Well, we mentioned the preaching uh, and the travels, and this is a comment on William Williams's preaching. He showed the difference between Christ in the head and Christ in the heart. Another comment. The spirit of Daniel Rowland is fallen on Brother Williams. Oh, what earnestness had he. And this is Howell Harris listening to Williams. Hell trembles when he comes and souls are daily taken by Brother Williams in the gospel net. Well, what an amazing testimony. And then another one, he showed that all means are quite in vain without the presence of God. My dear friends, we should be earnest in praying that ministers, when they come into the pulpit or onto a platform or whatever it is, that they should bring a sense of the presence of God with them. More than that, we should face up to our responsibility to bring a sense and a longing for the presence of God with us when we come to church and to pray before we come, Lord, be with us today. Be with your people in the means of grace. Attend the word of God, the preaching with your Holy Spirit. Well, uh, back to Williams and his marriage. He married a woman called Mary Frances uh, who had unusual gifts of music. And uh, William saw to it that she, he, she used those gifts. So whenever he had written a new hymn, he got her to sing a, a, a favorite tune or a familiar tune for that matter uh, to that that fitted with the words for the people to learn. Well, they had uh, children, six girls, one of whom died at two weeks. And then two boys, both of whom became clergymen, one of them in Cornwall, the other followed his father uh, to join the, the Calvinistic Methodists in Wales and issued a complete collection uh, of Williams's hymns. Williams wrote a book on marriage. It's called, in Welsh, Cavarwyddwr Priodas, A Guide to Marriage. Its purpose was to advise young converts and the ones that were in the societies, the fellowship meetings, were mainly young people. But he was advising these young people in the matter of marriage and about the relationship with the opposite sex. Two principles in particular were emphasized. Believers should not court or marry unbelievers. And believers with unbelieving partners, well, spouses, should endeavor to bring them to faith in Christ. And he ventured to say, a woman in this position with a husband who was an unbeliever could use her feminine charms to serve the spiritual purpose of gaining a hearing for the gospel from her husband. And he made some bold statements and the book wasn't published for a long time afterwards because of this. Our sex has power, Martha, especially when we have beauty and purity. And this is a woman called Mary, who is a Christian. And she's speaking to Martha, her friend. Our sex has power, Martha, especially when, when we have beauty and purity. And no little subtlety to tempt the, the wisest, the most discerning, the strongest of men, so that it is hard to escape our nets unless heaven's grace prevails. Our hearts are nets all the time, and we use all the ability and means at our disposal to make our bodies the same as well. Our hands and arms are a mighty double chain. With this chain, we can snuff out wrath and spark off love. We turn bears into babes and wolves into lambs. Men watch out. I mean, for his day, that was 
disturbing stuff. It was Williams's practice when he uh, was uh, in bed, uh, when he went to bed, that he would take candle and uh, writing material with him, so that if inspiration came, he could write out uh, the, the hymn there and then. Sometimes he would call upon a maid to help him, but he had a very drowsy maid who was very unwilling or unable to respond. So he wrote a little verse about her. I now see this quite clearly. Though sound of bells abound and paper mill be grinding, however harsh their sound, though brazen pan and cauldron should tumble down the stair, her bed collapse beneath her, she'd sleep without a care. <laughs> Some of his uh, humour comes to her. All right, but there were trials. One of the trials was Harris's, Harris's separation from the Welsh Methodist. And it was on account some, partly anyway, on account of some unorthodox views about the doctrine of the Trinity. We needn't go into that, but it was a very sad time throughout the 50s. It, it meant that Harris separated from the Welsh Methodists from the year 1750 to 1762, thereabouts, and started what was called the Trevecca family. But it wasn't altogether a dry period. There were revivals, and especially 1762, we shall come to that in a moment, there was a re great revival, probably the greatest revival of the century. The rest of Williams's life was taken up with consolidation, and the expression of that is what I want to come to now, although a bit late in the day, but still we'll do our best. Well, the first one you'll know is hymns. And uh, on the right there is just the, f uh, the, the title page of one of the Welsh collection of hymns. He started writing from 1744 because he was convinced that the gospel message was to be sung as well as believed and preached. It was to be sung. It was a cause of praise and of prayer. It could be personal, it could be public, but hymns were of great, great value. Because for two reasons. One was they, they distilled the gospel message in a very familiar and compelling way. They gripped you, the words gripped you, so they were memorable. And the other, of course, the other reason was this. Uh, they were memorable and therefore it was easy for them to learn doctrine, teaching, as well as identify with the depth of experience that was being expressed in that hymn. They were Christ-centered and uh, he was able to give advice uh, to people if they wanted to write hymns. I'm looking at Mr. Hughes. They should seek God's face and God's Holy Spirit. They should read books on poetry, and especially the poetic books of the Bible, chief among them being the Psalms and the Song of Solomon. And Williams often worked on until two or three in the morning. And then uh, he always took with him, as I've mentioned, a pen, paper, and a candle. But he did give advice about giving out hymns too. Some give out verses full of assurance and delight to a con congregation that denies the first assurance and has not experienced the second. Others give out verses of complaint and questioning to a people who have been elevated to the heavenlies and who feel life in their faith and Satan under their feet, as if to urge people to sing about the cold of winter while the sun blazes in hottest summer. So there needs to be that fitting, tailor-made of the hymns chosen for a message for a congregation. But what about the characteristics of a hymn? 
hymns, his hymns are full of biblical truth, as you'd expect, and the cross is central. There's frequent, me frequent meditation on Christ's passion as well as on his person, and we shall sing a hymn at the end uh, about that. Um, but here's a hymn about the cross. The enormous load of human guilt was on my Saviour laid with woes as with a garment he for sinners was arrayed and in the fearful pangs of death he wept he prayed for me loved and embraced my guilty soul when nailed to the tree and uh, it goes on oh love amazing love beyond the reach of human tongue love which shall be the subject of an everlasting song the hymns are biblical and the imagery is absolutely stirring and i'm going to just make one example of his imagery it's the welsh word signo to draw out or to suck in one hymn he speaks of the angels as sucking their pleasures from a glimpse of Christ's face. Let that absorb that for a minute. Imagine angels in heaven. They're gazing at Christ. They see his beautiful face and they draw pleasure from that. What a wonderful image. Okay, here's, here's another use of it. Let not the cares of the world suck away my desire after God. Draw, drain away the cares of the world, the attractions of the world for that matter. How easy it is during, we, we have our morning devotion perhaps, but very soon that fades into, uh, over the horizon, it vanishes. Uh, and as William tells us, the world sucks away our desire after God. My dear friends, let's be careful and maintain a desire after God. But here is one verse especially that uses that same word with great effect. Uh, and we can read it together. Oh, oh, I'll go back. Here we are. That's it. Can you see it? Can you read that? Right, let's read it together. Um, he came to heal the wounded. Right, ready? He came to heal the wounded, was wounded in their stead. The air of heaven was pierced for those through sin made dead. He sucked the awful poison the serpent gave to me. And from that deadly venom, he died on Calvary. You couldn't get anything more vivid than that to retain in your mind as to the meaning of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's William Williams's hymns. And it's uh, impressive. Right, let's move on now to, oh, that's a theology, to his theology, but to his teaching. There's a book by him called A View of Christ's Kingdom, Golu Gardernas Christ. Uh, a view of Christ's kingdom. Now, in it, uh, he insists on the Bible as the word of God. It has a covenantal framework. By that, we mean that God's dealings with us are by way of contract, solemn promises. Well, in the marriage ceremony, there's a solemn promise by either side. And that's a covenant. And God makes a covenant with us which is like a contract which, where God makes promise and God never breaks his promise. So that covenant is solid and sure. Well, the Bible speaks of several covenants, but the one that we are concerned about is the covenant of grace, whereby God made a covenant with Christ that he would give to Christ a people to be delivered from their sin to belong to him 
and to spend eternity with him in glory. And the covenant depended on both sides keeping it. And hallelujah, Christ has kept every bit of that promise on our behalf. And in that way and for that very reason, you and I can enter into a contract with God, a covenant with God where we can say, I am his and he is mine forever and forever. Well now, Williams in this book on uh, Christ's kingdom, it has been translated into English, published back in 1878. Books are very rare now. But it's, in it he speaks of the Bible as the statute book of Christ's kingdom. How precious it is. Protestant in its conviction and then <coughs> um, important in its influence because it deals with uh, the covenant and it deals with the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I'll read a little bit about that for you now. Uh, and then to God the Father shall Christ the shepherd give those sheep beyond all number who through his blood now live. A bride whose graceful beauty a thousand dawns outshone who followed every footstep where her great king had gone. That's the shepherd and the sheep. And then this affirmation of hope at the end of the book, my, um, at the end of another book by Williams, my body will be raised like my beloved zone, free from all, from those ill desires which often made me groan. No man beneath the heavens can fully know my bliss and no one can imagine such heavenly pleasure this. Heaven is glorious, not only because of the absence of sin, thank God for that, but because of the presence of Christ. Well now, uh, we can move on. Uh, there were other public, other writings. One of them was called Pantheologia, and uh, it was about religion, true and false. So he deals with um, Roman Catholicism, he deals with Hinduism, he deals with Islam, shows their deceit, exposes them. Then he comes to the true religion, biblical religion, Protestantism. Three, well, I, uh, three men from Sodom and Egypt. Well, he has three examples. Uh, one is avaricious, one is prodigalous, and one is fidelious. Well, avaricious is greedy, prodigalous is, is waster, he spe spends all his money and everything, lives totally for the world. Fidelius is a man of faith. Well, they're in Welsh, they're not in English. Aurora Borealis was about the Northern Lights and about the future prospects for the Christian. And uh, that again had uh, an important place in uh, Williams's theology. And then we're going to come to this book, Pursued by God. Uh, that's the title that is shown there, is it? Yes. Well, there it is in a modern version. Per it's been translated from the Welsh back in 1996 by uh, this strange man, Havian Evans. I, I told you it had 1,451 verses, but I can't claim fame because uh, I've kind of cheated and reduced it to about, what was it, about 400 verses, and then filled the rest up with notes. But a little word about it, because the title comes from the introduction to the book, where uh, what Williams is doing is trying to portray for us an ideal Christian. As ideal as he can be in this world, we're not ideal Christians, any of us, we're not perfect, any of us, but as something to pursue. But the point is, he is saying, in the first place, his name was Theo, my son, hater of God. But his name has been changed because now 
He's been pursued by God. God has chased him, literally pursued him, and got hold of him, and turned him around, and he's a new creature. So it's now the story of his life, of his conversion, and of his experience, of his temptations, of his fears at death. All these in this book. Listen to some of the verses in this book. I see within my nature lies stubborn unbelief, so strong and so unbounded, there's no secure relief of all sins under heaven. This has the blackest dye, nor is there any other whose roots much deeper lie. Oh, for God's grace and mercy to plant true faith within God's grace alone can lift me from the deep pit of sin. Faith makes a conscience tender. Faith deals with guilt and pain. Faith cleanses Theomemphus. For this, God's lamb was slain. O oh, grace, that's free and changeless, eternally secure. The lamb who died was wounded alone provides sin's cure for guilt and shame true healing the fear of death subdued and love forever grounded on peace with power endued wonderful stuff and in a nutshell it compasses doesn't it the christian's experience but that was the intention of it to show these young christians in the society meeting what really they would expect in the Christian life and in the book there's the leader of the society by the name of Dr. Aletheus, Dr. Truth, right? And he's a doctor but not a doctor of the body, he's a physician of the soul and that is the one, he's the one who asks questions, we'll come to that in a moment as we come to the end shortly. But here in that uh, particular portrayal of the Christian life, it was to be a Christ-centered life. Then there's this matter of the experience meeting, a society proviad. That has been translated back in 1970 or so by no one other than Mrs. Dr. Lloyd-Jones, under the title of the Experience Meeting. I think that that is still available. Anyway, but its contents is this, uh, are these. For one thing, it's to monitor Christian experience. Here will be people being converted, and not just in twos or threes, but in multitudes across the land. And in their churches, they wouldn't be fed. So the Methodists arranged these society meetings for fellowship where they would read the Bible, sing hymns, pray together and share experiences. And that was vital and because the leader then was to, like a clinician, was to make diagnosis. What was the great need of that individual at that time? Because if you were able to share your experience, others would profit from what this leader would draw from scripture as a remedy for your ailment at that particular moment, whether it was encouragement or rebuke or whatever, or instruction in faith. Well, it was monitoring experience and encouraging maturity. Now, there were qualifications required for leadership. Listen to this, a good counselor perceives what sin keeps the one being counseled from God. He can discover the murky layers where Satan and sin, the flesh and lust for the world and its idols are lurking. As an angler knows where the fish are and the mole catcher the paths of the mole and the fowler the haunts of the partridge. That's the skill that was required but it was a very useful kind of discipline. And then what about the reports? There were reports of those societies sometimes. Listen to this. 
Here, most of them continue to be zealous and closely cleaving to the Lord. They are in much union among themselves as an army with banners. That must have been a good society. And then here's another one. Here are some few that have highly attained to the assurance of their being justified to the enjoyment of God and the knowledge of their own hearts. But the most part of them are weak and very simple and in sincerity seeking the Lord. Well, the questions that were asked were different for those who are new in the society, for those different from who are older in society. You must not expect as much of the light of faith and assurance in those newly received into membership as in those already in. And then, on this next slide, this is the kind of thing that they were looking for. Assurance. This was their aim. They believed that there was more of God. Press on. Don't be satisfied with being in the holy place. You are a priest, but press on into the holy of holies to know more of God all the time. Let's say this verse together. Tell me thou art mine, O Saviour. Grant me an assurance clear. Banish all my dark misgivings. Still my doubting, calm my fear. O oh, my soul within me yearneth, now to hear thy voice divine. So shall grief be gone forever, and despair no more be mine. Well, there were people who saw their fervency and excitement, their literally shouting and almost dancing in the aisles as fanatics or in their vocabulary enthusiasts. And there was one person who said of them, all these Methodists, they're jumpers, jumpers. They go around jumper, jumping with joy. And one of the Methodist wits replied, you call us jumpers, jumpers. We call you sleepers, sleepers. Are we too inhibited in our worship? It's a question. I know I am, but there is a lack of joy amongst us sometimes, isn't there? Whereas there should be praise and adoration and fervency and a drawing out of, not of, not of necessity jumping, but in our hearts of rejoicing in the Lord. And like Moses coming down from the mount with our faces reflecting something of the glory of God. Well, so it should be. Well, now we're going to come to uh, one last matter, uh, which is revival. And revival, the characteristics, is an extraordinary work. Extraordinary. You can't have a revival all the time. But thank God, revival some of the time. It's been a long time. But revival can be local, congregational. And what Christian is there that doesn't long for new life, fresh vigor in his soul? That's revival in a personal sense. But revival, generally speaking, means on a widespread scale. That is supernatural. It is extraordinary. But we should never dismiss it. And we should always pray for it. So there were vast crowds. They traveled vast distances. There's the story of somebody coming from North Wales to hear Daniel Rowland preach, traveling all day from North Wales on horseback or walking or whatever they did, and eventually arriving in the evening just about when the service was going to start. And he said, I was fitter to go to bed than go to chapel. But when Daniel Rowland started opening the barrels of God's grace, I forgot all about sleep and spent the rest of the night praising God and rejoicing at, in the house afterwards. Something that was gripping because of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. There were lasting conversions from the world as well. And that revival of 1762 was the most powerful. Uh, there was an issue of fresh 
hymns from William Williams, which was partly responsible for that uh, revival breaking out at Langeithal. And the other uh, uh, contributory factor was a prayer meeting. And listen to this. The prayer meeting had been going down in number and going colder in its fervency. And in the end, they said, well, let's meet one more time. We'll have a time of prayer and then we'll close. We may as well give up. So the meeting was beginning. And all of a sudden, the one who seldom prayed started praying. And something came over him, the Holy Spirit. And he broke out. And it was as if his heart was aflame. And that spread amongst the rest in the prayer meeting. And everybody started praising God all of a sudden. And they couldn't hold themselves back. And the revival took off from that time. Well, there were the contributory factors. Now, there were problems, no doubt about it. And Williams wrote two significant books about that. Well, they're short uh, books. One was called The Letter of Martha, and the, the other one was called The Answer of Philo. But he, uh, re he, uh, he writes the biblical um, defense of true revival in those two uh, short works. Well, we come to an end, and William Williams' legacy, I mentioned at the beginning, was to reproduce New Testament Christianity. Don't blame me for this. I believe that Calvinistic Methodism was just another name for New Testament Christianity. And I can blame somebody else for that claim, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. <laughs> and I'm not just name dropping, but uh, it's significant because of the purity of the preaching, the believing, the work of conversion, the reviving of God's work, the extension of Christ's kingdom. There was that New Testament quality about it. And although it's got the label Calvinistic Methodism, that doesn't really matter. What matters is that we seek in our day, in our midst, to reproduce that New Testament Christianity. And it uh, turns around three points, in my view. Truth, life, and power. Truth, God is not silent. He hasn't stopped speaking. And his word is absolute truth. It's the last word on everything. You can depend on it. You can trust it. You can live your life on its foundation. And you can be sure in the face of death that God will see you through. That's truth. God is not silent. So if you're back against the wall, if you feel that the bottom has fallen out of your little world, turn to God and ask him, Lord, from your word, give me a promise. Speak to me. And he'll do just that. And then life, God is not dead. Oh, he's very much alive. He's in control of the universe. He's sovereign. He's still on the throne. And he knows about our situations. He controls our circumstances. He's ahead of us every time. Nothing takes him by surprise. He prepares, he protects, he provides everything. It's all in his hand because he is alive. Our Savior is alive. And because he lives, I shall live also. And it brings hope to our souls. We are frail, we are flawed, we are weak, we are sinners, but we are saved by grace. And grace by its very nature is something that crowns us eventually with glory. Thank God for that. God is alive. And then the final thing, the power. How can I live the Christian life in the power of the Holy Spirit? He's given us the comforter to live in us to glorify Christ through us by lip and by life, to bless the means of grace, the preaching of God's word, 
the fellowship of God's people, the evangelizing efforts that we put in as a congregation in the work of God. The Holy Spirit is for us. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Remember William's Pantechillion for that reason. And let's follow in his steps. We're going to close with another hymn to sing from William's Pantechillion. It's a familiar one, but it's a very personal one. It's a testimony. Jesus, Jesus, all sufficient. Beyond telling is thy worth in thy name like greater treasures than the richest found on earth. Such abundance is my portion with my God. Thank you for listening. Amen. Thank you. you are an unchanging God, the one who has done great things for your people down through the ages, and we look to you, our eyes, the gaze of our souls are upon you, to do great things for us, and in us, and by us. Grant us these mercies, and uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, now and evermore. Amen.